Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Moriarty by Anthony Horowitz. So this is like an official licensed kind of sequel or tie-in with the Sherlock Holmes series, I suppose. Anthony Hor Horowitz wrote the Anthony... Alec no, he wrote the Alex Ryder books, which are pretty popular. I have my coffee as well. I'm going to read you the blurb, and then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then we'll have ratings and overall thoughts at the end. Days after Sherlock Holmes and his archenemy Moriarty fall to their doom at the Reichenbach Falls, Pinkerton agent Frederick Chase arrives in Europe from New York. The death of Moriarty has created a poisonous vacuum which has been swiftly filled by a fiendish new criminal mastermind who has risen to take his place. Ably assisted by Inspector Athelney Jones of Scotland Yard, Chase must forge a path through the darkest corners of the capital to shine a light on this shadowy figure, a man determined to engulf London in a tide of murder and menace. Author of the global bestseller The House of Silk, Anthony Horowitz once more breathes life into the world created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. With pitch-perfect characterisation and breathtaking pace, Horowitz weaves a relentlessly thrilling tale which teases and delights by the turn of each page. And I did read The House of Silk and quite enjoyed it at the time, although it has been a while. I, I think I read that when it first came out. So we get some little tie-ins um, back to the Sherlock Holmes original books, so for example here. After that, Jones turned away, immersing himself in a printed pamphlet which he had brought with him and which turned out to be a monograph by Sherlock Holmes, no less, this one on the subject of Ash. Apparently, or so Jones assured me, Holmes was able to differentiate between 140 different types of ash from cigars, cigarettes and pipes, although he himself had only mastered 90 of them. To humour him, I made my way to the salon dining room and took a pinch of five different samples from the mystified passengers. Jones was extremely grateful and spent the next hour examining them minutely with a magnifying glass he had extracted from his travelling bag. He's describing um, Regent Street and he says, It seemed that there was nothing you could find here that was not expensive and very little that was actually necessary. Yep. We have a reference to opium, which I always enjoy. Uh, there, there may have been uh, powdered opium inside a curry that has been eaten. The curry would have disguised the taste. So we talk about a barber here, um, and this is kind of important as well. We entered the building and found ourselves in a small, uncomfortable room with a single barber's chair facing a mirror so cracked and dusty that it barely showed any reflection at all. There were two shelves lined with bottles of Horner's Luxuriant, as well as other hair restorers and cantharides lotions. The floor hadn't been swept and tufts of old hair were still strewn across it. As unsavoury a sight as one could wish to see, though not as bad as the soap bowl, a congealed mess which still carried the spiky fragments of men's beards. I was already beginning to think that this was the last place in London I would wish to come for a haircut when the barber himself arrived. He had climbed up a staircase in the back parlour and tottered towards us, wiping his hands on a handkerchief. It was hard to determine his age. He was both old and young at the same time with a round, quite pleasant face, clean shaven and smiling. But he had a terrible haircut. Indeed, it was as if he had been attacked by a cat. His hair was long on one side, short on the other with patches missing altogether, exposing his skull. Nor had it been washed for some time, leaving it with both a colour and a texture that was disagreeable to say the least. But I'm there like, isn't the old story that you go, if you've got the two hairdressers in the town, you go to the one with the worst haircut because he has to get it done by the other barber. We get this little throwaway line here. I fear it will be some time before the Metropolitan Police are prepared to admit women to their ranks, Jones remarked. And we get this ginger guy and he turns out to be uh, the inventor of the Red-Headed League, which I kind of saw coming because you can... Basically, you can tell if you've read all of the original Sherlock Holmes books, when you get these things that are meant to be like little subtle clues, if they tie back into the original books, it's pretty obvious, you know? I quite like this little descriptive paragraph here. Dead Man's Walk has long since disappeared. It was one of those cemeteries built in the first part of the century when nobody understood how many people would live in London and therefore, inevitably, die there. All too quickly it had become oversubscribed with so many bodies crammed in next to one another that the tombstones and memorials, rather than providing the solace and remembrance that had been intended, had become a hideous spectacle, slanting at strange angles, leaning on each other, locked in an eternal struggle for space. For many years a foul and putrid smell had hung over the place. The later graves were desperately shallow, unequal to the task, and it would not be uncommon to find rotting pieces of coffin wood, or even shards of human bone poking through the soil. Inevitably, the cemetery had been abandoned. Other cemeteries had been sold off and some had become parks. But Dead Man's Walk had been left behind, a long irregular space between a railway line and an old workhouse, with rusting gates at each end, a few mouldy trees and a sense that it belonged neither to this world nor to the next, but existed in a dark, dismal province of its own. So this bit 
the the bad guy is basically implied that he's mental because he's vegetarian. Um, so it says here, Will it surprise you to learn that I grew up with the strongest disinclination ever to eat meat myself? From the moment I was able to make my own decisions, I became what has come to be called a vegetarian, a word that originated here in England, you might like to know. The lifelong condition from which I've suffered, I also blame on my childhood. I used to have nightmares about the animals trapped in their pens, awaiting the horrors of the slaughterhouse. I saw their eyes staring at me through the bars, and somehow their fear transmitted itself to me. In my young mind, it occurred to me that the animals were safe only when they remained locked up, that once they were removed from their cages, they would be butchered, and so I in turn became afraid of open spaces, the outside world. As a child, I drew the covers over my head before I could sleep. In a way, those covers have remained in place ever since. Which, you know, I'm vegan, so... I, I should be even more agoraphobic, I guess. Alright, and then we get this twist near the end, which I don't want to reveal, at least fully. Um, a minor spoiler of it, I guess, is that we get a, a, a bit that's written from Moriarty's point of view. Um, and I'm going to read a few of the bits from that. So I like here where it gets a little bit meta. Um, where he's talking about writing. He says, An elaborate game, you might think, but I have found the business of writing a curiously tedious one. All those hours spent pummeling away at a machine that has proved unequal to the task of 80,246 words, a, pe a peculiarity of mine, the ability to count and to recall the number of every word as I go. Several of the keys have jammed and the letter E is so faded as to be indecipherable. One day, someone will have to type the whole thing again. My old adversary, Sherlock Holmes, was fortunate indeed to have his Watson, the faithful chronicler of his adventures, but I could afford no such luxury. I know that this will not be published in my lifetime, if at all. Such is the nature of my profession. And we actually, um, we get a little story, a little short story as well, that's like uh, presented as though it's been published in The Stand, and it features Holmes and Watson, and Watson narrating it. I'm just trying to find the cover of it for you guys. The Strand Magazine, The Three Monarchs by Dr. John B. Watson. Uh, but again, the gimmick in that is the same as the gimmick there, that it wasn't allowed out until a certain amount of time had passed. And Moriarty says as well, the most disagreeable experience of his tussle with Holmes was that Holmes reeked of tobacco and that Moriarty's never been fond of human contact. So yeah, overall, I guess I did enjoy Moriarty. For me, it was a 3.5 out of 5. It was competently written. It wasn't as good as The House of Silk. That twist at the end did really get me, so there is that, I suppose. Mainly because I thought it was leading towards this other twist and doing it really clumsily, and it turns out it was deliberately misleading me, which I suppose is quite cool. I don't think I'd recommend this unless you're a Sherlock Holmes mega fan and you've already read all of the other Holmes books. But if you have read all of the Holmes books and you want to get some more, why not, you know? So there we have it. That's what I thought of Moriarty by Anthony Horowitz. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.